Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of E102. Some announcements. The midterm is going to be released on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday at 8 a.m. and it is due the following day also at 8 a.m. The exam is open internet, so you're welcome to use the internet, but please don't use the internet to chat with friends because the honor code that applies here is to do the exam work individually. We also have some changes to office hours this week for myself. Uh, I'm gonna not have office hours on Wednesday because that's the day of the exam, but instead I'll have it the previous day from six to 7 p.m. I will also release a short video on review topics on Monday, which is today essentially. Um, it, right now it's about 2 a.m. on Monday uh, Pacific time. So I'll release a short video on review topics right after I make this lecture. One other topic is that this lecture, this particular lecture is not covered in the midterm and there is no homework this week. So if you like, because there's no homework and this, this is not on the exam, it would make perfect sense to simply ignore this lecture until after you complete the exam. So feel free to do that. Okay, so this lecture, lecture uh, one other reason that you're welcome to uh, watch it after the midterm is that in contrast to basic signals and system, this lecture is gonna break a new seal. It's gonna really uh, break a seal in the way that we think about class topics because we're gonna to move to that frequency domain that I introduced at the beginning of the class. We're gonna eventually build up to this topic called the Fourier transform, okay? And the Fourier transform is something that is very, very general to a lot of different signals in computer science and engineering. So here's just one of many examples. Uh, it's a cartoon from XKCD. CD. And in this cartoon, somebody has taken the Fourier transform of their cat, right? This is, uh, uh, this is just showing that you could take the Fourier transform of almost anything. And the person who the Fourier transform is named after is a man called Joseph Fourier. And he comes around in the late 17, 90s and the early 1800s with his seminal work. Now this person, Fourier, has a very interesting uh, sort of trajectory in his life. He's the son of a tailor uh, and he's orphaned at 10 years old. And he's a super ambitious guy, right? He's a mathematician from a young age, super bright. And as a young man, he feels at age 21, he's comparing himself to Newton, right? He says, you know what, at 21, I'm already 21, I haven't achieved as much as someone like Isaac Newton had achieved at 21. So those of you who feel uh, like you're, you also may be approaching 21, just so you know, there's a lot of hope to do great work later in life. So Fourier says, you know what, maybe mathematics is not for me, so let me go into politics. And he ends up being arrested because this is around the time of the French Revolution. Around 1794, he narrowly escapes the, the guillotine in the French Revolution. So you can see that uh, up until 1794, maybe he's in his 20s right now, mid 20s, he doesn't really have uh, much going for him, right? He's basically escaped execution. So then what he does is after the political climate changes, he ends up getting acceptance to the Ecole series of schools, right? Ecole means school in French. He gets acceptance to uh, the academic institutes in French, uh, which at this time, the professors there are many of the professors whose topics are, are world renowned. So some of his professors at the Ecole included Lagrange, right? Who's familiar for Lagrangian techniques and optimization, and another one of his professors was Laplace. And Laplace is someone we'll also talk about later in the class. So Fourier takes classes from Lagrange and Laplace. And based on, on these insights, he's able to come up with very original work called the Fourier series and Fourier transform, which we'll review today. Briefly, this is also a, a kind of a tale, almost like Star Wars, where Anakin Skywalker surpasses Obi-Wan Kenobi in some ways, right? Uh, this is a, where if Laplace was the teacher to Fourier, in many ways, Fourier came up with ideas that today have su uh, surpassed Laplace in practicality and originality and creativity in some ways. 
So in fact, when Laplace was evaluating Fourier's work, right, because he's the senior teacher, in many ways, Laplace was not able to grasp the work and gave it an unfavorable review. But that was really a testament to the originality and creativity of Fourier's analysis, which is the subject of today's lecture. Okay, so let's begin with a little bit of intuition. Let's talk about why somebody would use the Fourier series. Oops, okay, my computer is frozen here. Just give me a moment. Okay, let's talk about why somebody would use the Fourier series. So sort of the bottom line of the Fourier series, okay, is that any periodic signal can be expressed as a sum of sinusoids. So for example, if I have some signal x of t, I am more than welcome, if x of t is periodic, to write this as x of t equals x1 of t plus x2 of t plus other terms, okay? So other sub-signals. So you take x of t and you break it down into a summation of different signals, uh, x1 of t, x2 of t, and so on. Now, what's super interesting here is that these signals right here, this is a sinusoid. This is a sinusoid. So any periodic signal can be broken down into an infinite summation of sine waves, okay? you turn this complicated signal x of t, which could be quite frankly anything, into the summation of some, one of the most simple signals that we know about, which is the sine wave. And so what this does is in general, this simplifies the analysis simplifies the analysis of systems. The Fourier transform, if I go up a level, is a different way to think about data and information. And for your analysis, you know, being a different way, it can reveal interesting or unexpected structure in a signal. Let me write that down. All right. So the Fourier series, what it does is it extracts frequency structure from a signal. You may have seen this example earlier in the class where we have a C major chord. A C major chord, as, as you may know from music theory, a chord is, is, is named for the bass note uh, that it takes. So C is at uh, uh, 261.1 hertz, and it has three notes, a C, E, and a G. And you can play these three notes at the same time, creating some waveform indicated by the blue line. Now, because this is not a sine wave, it's a chord, it's hard to see structure, right? If this was a, a, a nice C note, you might see a sine wave like this, but we don't because it's a chord. So interestingly, as some of you have commented, we have a guitar in the back. So this is what a C chord sounds like. So a C chord sounds like this, right? 
you may have the C note here, but then you're actually playing multiple notes at the same time. Okay, so you have a C major chord consisting of these multiple notes. And the Fourier series, you're able to write this signal applying the analysis that we're gonna learn in this class from our good friend Fourier to turn this complicated signal into basically what amounts to, in this picture, three directs. Okay, we turn this complex signal, which basically looks uninterpretable like noise, into three directs. And that is the magic, one of the magical properties of the Fourier transform. This is visually seeing that simplification. Okay, so the bottom line about the Fourier transform is that if f of t is a well-behaved periodic signal, and we will go into more mathematical detail in further lectures about what that means, but right now just assume that f of t is a well-behaved periodic signal with a period t naught, then that signal can be written always as a Fourier series. This Fourier series takes this form of equation. Now remember that this equation, when we have the complex exponential, if you have e to the power of j k omega naught t, remember that thanks to Euler's, this is equal to cosine of k omega naught t plus j sine k omega naught t. So if I just look at the real part, this is like a cosine, and you're basically looking at a summation of cosines if you just look at it in terms of real, multiplied by some constant. So it's a scaled version of cosines at different frequency. Now, of course, in this particular equation, it's actually written in complex, and we do have to consider complex in the Fourier transform. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase the complex term here and rewrite it in a different color. Now, if I rewrite in this color, what I can do is I can form this curve to show you what one particular complex exponential looks like. And what it does is it looks like okay, something like this. Um, so for a given k, You have a plot that looks something like this. And then of course, you have the sine wave that is phase shifted. You have a sine wave that is phase shifted slightly. So. Okay. Something like this. Okay, so we have this sine wave in magenta that is a little bit phase shifted from the blue. And remember, the sine wave is the imaginary part, the magenta, and the cosine, which is in blue, is the real part. Now, in this particular case, both sinusoids have a peak amplitude that they attain. It should be the same. So all of these are at the same peak amplitude if it was drawn exactly to scale. And this peak amplitude is at a value of ck, where ck is the constant, so that really describes here where the cosine is hitting this axis. Okay. All right, so now we have ck here, and remember that when we have a period t naught, that the period t naught has a corresponding angular frequency, omega naught equals two pi over t naught. So the kind of TLDR of this lecture is that one, any signal that is well behaved and periodic, you know, periodic can be broken down into a summation of complex exponentials 
summation of sinusoids. It's a summation of cosines and sines. And when we look at these cosines or sines, we know what each cosine or sine is. These are almost like basis vectors. And we're trying to find these coefficients. We, don't, we know that every signal is, every, any periodic signal is a summation of sines and cosines, but we don't know how much to mix of sines and cosines. And that's where this constant CK comes into play. So the first goal is to show that any signal can be broken down into sines and cosines, periodic signal. And the second goal is then to see what is the mixture of sinusoids and cosines, and that is to find the coefficients. So the second goal is to find the mixing coefficients of each sinusoid. And these coefficients are CK. And to find it, we have this integral transform, this equation here, this integral transform, which enables us to find the coefficients. This is the TLDR of the lecture. Now what we're interested in is going a little deeper into these equations, where they come from, and also how they can be used to simplify signals and signal structure. So the first topic that we'll touch on is eigenfunctions of an LTI system. So we say that x of t is an eigenfunction of a system if when inputting x of t to a system, the output is a scaled version of x of t. So here's an example. Let's say I have some x of t, and this goes into some system black box H. Now, it turns out that if x of t is a very special signal, it happens to be an eigenfunction with respect to H, then the output of this is going to be A x of t. It's going to be the same thing that you got out, but just some constant A that's being applied to it. Now, the key to note here. All right, this is absolutely key. Is that complex exponentials are eigenfunctions of LTI systems? Okay, complex exponentials are eigenfunctions of LTI systems. And so in this case, if we have some, let's say we have some H that happens to be LTI, and I put in, so I have H, it happens to be LTI, and I put in a complex exponential, so a complex exponential would look something like this, e to the sigma plus j omega t. Right, this is a complex exponential. If I put this into the system, then what I end up getting out in this particular case is ae to the sigma plus j omega So in this particular case, I am showing that complex exponentials are indeed eigenfunctions of LS LTI systems. You will often also see me in the class very frequently. Uh, I'll misspeak and I'll say, so LTI systems, right, are what we are studying in this class. I'll very frequently say LSI systems. This is the notation that we use in graduate classes when we deal with multidimensional signals. Right now we're only dealing with signals with one variable like x of t, but we might deal with multiple variables and then we typically use LSI or linear space invariant to talk about these. It means the exact same thing. So if I ever mention LSI, you can just mentally replace that with LTI, but I'll try not to say LSI. But just so you know, it's an advanced topic in multi-dimensional signal processing that you'll learn about. Okay, so you have an LTI system with impulse response h of t. And if the input to this LTI system is a complex exponential, then we know that we are sure to get out a complex exponential that's just been scaled by some amount. OK. Now, let us go through and actually derive why this is the case. So let's look at this equation, y of t equals integral from minus infinity to infinity 
of some impulse response, right, h of tau, times x, uh, well, let me write the convolution equation. In the top left, let me write the convolution equation, right? If I have a LTI system, the output of the LTI system, just in case uh, you have forgotten, is minus infinity to infinity of h of tau x of t minus tau d tau. Okay, so that is the equation for convolution that describes a system where we have x goes into h to give me y. Okay, so that describes this particular system. So in that particular case, if I have very specifically a complex exponential going in, so if I have instead of x, I have, for example, let's say I have uh, e to the st going into a system. So some sort of complex exponential, and you'll see that the variable s has been substituted just to make the notation a little bit more swift. So I have e to the st, and that goes into a system h, and we get an output y. Now that output y is equal to this, because e to the st replaces x, and so if we replace x with e to the st, we simply get this equation. All right, so now let me erase this. We have this equation, so let's start from here. So we have this equation for y of t. y of t equals the convolution between e, uh, the complex exponential, and h. So now if I actually just go mathematically write the next line of this derivation, so I can actually simplify this. So what I can do is if I look at the exponent, I can actually split the exponent. Okay, so I can simply split the exponent this way. And now if I look at this equation, I can pop this out because it's a constant. It doesn't depend on tau. All right, now in this particular case, remember that we put e of st into the system. So this, and I'm gonna put a triangles equal here, uh, this is nothing but, h hat of s times e to the st, h hat of s, equals to infinity h of tau okay so h hat of s is also known as the transfer function so this is the transfer function of a system all right, let's break it down. So it's pretty clear how we got from this equation to this equation, right? We simply did the algebra to split the exponent. Now it's pretty clear how we got from here because we simply pop out the constant. So pop out constant. This is just algebra. And this triangles equal is a definition. You may see this in some of your other classes. Triangles equal is just a definition. You're defining something. So I might define a new variable to mean something. So for example, this is a definition. I take j, and I'm going to define this to be uh, square root of negative 1. So here, in this particular case, I am going to define some new symbol that I just made up out of thin air, I call that h with the hat over it, okay? h hat, and it's a function of s, and that's going to be this stuff, okay? 
it's going to be everything that e of st is multiplied by. So in this particular case, let me use the same color. h hat of s times e to the st. So what have I done? I haven't really done much. I've just defined this new function, transfer function, that doesn't depend on the complex exponential, doesn't depend on the input. So if you look, the input to the system was e to the st, and the output y of t, I'm showing that the output y of t equals e of st times this you know, strange function h hat of s. So in this particular case, h hat of s, the output of that is going to be a constant. So clearly, the complex exponential is an eigenfunction of the L L LTI system. And the constant that multiplies the sort of eigenvalue of that is dependent on what the value of this integral is, which is also known as the transfer function. What it does intuitively is it tells you how much of that signal is passed. The transfer function tells you if I have a complex exponential at frequency s, s is in SAM, that goes into my system, I'm going to get out a complex exponential that's the same, but it could be attenuated. For example, let's just, I'm just going to make up a number just to give you the intuition. Let's say I'm going to put in uh, e of 440 times t, okay? Sort of like a musical note. And it goes into h to give me y of t. Really, you would have 2 pi times 440, right? So in this particular case, I'm going to get out the same signal. I'm going to get out the same tone. I'm going to get out e to 2 pi 440, but it's going to be scaled by some constant a. That constant a is going to be what's in the purple here, which is the transfer function. And so it tells me how my system responds to a sinusoid at this frequency. For example, a could be 0. So what this means is that this frequency is not transferred in the system. The system might kill that frequency. Uh, one example is vibrations, right? Some frequencies will transmit through a medium, and some other frequencies will just be killed because they don't match any resonant frequencies, or they might be too high, or, or so on and so forth. Another example is sound. Our ears, our, our, the bone structure of our ears in the ear canal, it will not pass frequencies above 20,000 hertz. So if I send in 20,000 hertz, something above 20,000 hertz to our system, it's going to have an eigenvalue that is going to be close to zero. It's going to have a transfer function that is zero. And in general, we have a transfer function being defined across all s. And it tells us, so here's basically 20 hertz. Here is 20,000 hertz. And the human ear, we know, is sensitive to these two. So we can say that the value here is some non-zero value. And as you get out of here, it becomes zero. Okay, So this is kind of like a binarized version of the transfer function for the human ear. So the transfer function is a quality of the system, and it's expressed by this integral form equation. OK. Now, the intuition behind eigenfunctions is, well, first, we already mentioned that the complex exponential is an eigenfunction. But what this really builds towards is now bringing back Fourier series analysis into the problem. So let me give you the high level. We know that you have a signal x of t. And if the signal was a complex exponential, we, we already know what the output is going to be, right? If I have an LTI system and I put a complex exponential in, what is the output? Well, it's nothing but another complex exponential. So I have solved the signals and systems problem. The whole class is solved if I am only putting in complex exponentials. Now, the problem, of course, is that not all signals are simple sinusoids, right? X of t can be complex, like complicated signal. It could be an intricate signal. But now this is where Joseph Fourier comes into play. He tells me that my signal x can be decomposed into a, a sum of sinusoids. And that, so I can, because the system is linear, I can just put in each sinusoid into my system and then calculate the response. So we're going to now formalize this intuition and get to the math. So 
let's say, for the sake of argument, that I'm going to write x of t as being a periodic signal. So say x of t is periodic. Then we can also say that x of t equals the sum All right, so this is simply the Fourier series of x of t. And x of t, if we were to intuitively write it, is going to be, if I break the sum, what I'm really doing is I'm adding x1 of t plus x2 of t plus x3 of t so all of these x1, x2, x3 with a subscript are different sinusoids. Right? They're different indices of complex exponentials, indices of k. So the first step I'm going to do is now I'm going to take one particular complex exponential. So I'm going to take one particular complex exponential. So let's say So for, for argument's sake, I can take k equals 1. So if I take k equals 1, then what I'm going to get at is x1 of t is going to equal c sub k becomes c sub 1 times e to j omega naught t. Now, let's apply system H to X of T. Okay. So in this particular case, I'm going to get something that looks like this. y of t equals c1 e j omega naught t. Okay, so all I've done is I've just taken one particular complex exponential, let's say k equals one, and that gives me this form for x1, and then I can just pass that through an LTI system, and because it's LTI, I know I'm just gonna get out exactly what I put in, which is c1 times the complex exponential, multiplied by this very unique transfer function. So I can repeat this for another complex exponential. So I can take another complex exponential, let's say k equals two. So now, if I do k equals two, then x two of t is gonna equal c sub two e to the j two omega naught t. And I'm gonna pass this as before through the system. So I'm gonna get y two of t equals, and I'm going to use blue font here. I'm going to have that same transfer function. Actually, let me use red font. Okay. 
So I have this blue plot, meaning that I look at the same transfer function, but I look at a different um, value of the transfer function at for k equals two. And this, of course, gets multiplied by what I put into the system, which was C2EJ of two omega naught t. Okay, so in this particular case, we can extend the analysis by saying, well, let's say that H was linear. Okay, so let's say that H was linear. If H is linear, then what I can do is I can write this. So let's say it's linear then it also is true that h of x1 plus x2 equals y1 plus y2. So now what I can do is I can take the input x of t equals the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of ck e to the jk omega naught t, right? This is just rewriting the Fourier series equation. But now I can do this. I don't need to do it for k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3. I can rewrite it in general. I can write the output of the system as being equal to the sum of Right, so y of t in this particular case, let me just write it concretely, right? Y, so if, if x of t, if we think about x of t equaling x1 of t plus x2 of t plus and so on, then I can also equally write, since the system is linear, I can in the same fashion write y of t equals y1 of t plus y2 of t plus so on. Okay, because the system is linear. So in general, I have an infinite summation here. So I can simply rewrite this infinite summation in more compact notation. That's all I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write this in more compact notation as the sum from k equals negative infinity to infinity of essentially xk of t, right? And remember that xk of t in this particular case is actually going to be equal to the Fourier series expression, just substituting what's right here. So it's going to be the summation of, actually, let me back up for a moment. Okay, h hat of k. So it's gonna be equal to the sum of x, k of t. So x of t equals the sum of x, k of t, right, as well. But y of t is gonna be the sum of x, k of t multiplied by its transfer coefficient, right? It's Fourier series coefficient or Fourier coefficients. So we can neatly substitute everything here by actually just substituting variables. So in this particular case, I have h hat of j, k, omega naught, and this is, ck e to jk omega naught t. All right. So this is how the system's output can be described if the input is a sum of complex exponentials. So the input here is a sum of complex exponentials that allows me to always write this output in, in the following form. Now, in the language of Fourier series coefficients that we discussed earlier, if x of t is the Fourier series coefficients with ck as being the scaling in front of the complex exponential, you can think of this itself also being, right, this itself also being a, a similar version of ck. So we can write this as also some, instead of using the h notation, I can simply say that this green h multiplied by the black ck 
gives me a new CK tilde. Okay. So I'm going to define CK tilde is going to be defined as H of JK omega naught multiplied by CK. So then I can use C tilde K multiplied by the complex exponential e to the j k omega naught t. Okay, so this is the Fourier series um, expansion of the problem. Now, those of you who are at home and want to understand more about how we got from here to here, you can apply the principles of linearity. Remember in the previous class, some of you asked in office hours about, um, essentially what we've done here is, if I take X of T and put it into the system, the H should really have been on the outside. So this, if I apply H to the system X of T, it really should have been Y of T equals H times the summation of CK e to the J thing, right? So the H should have been on the outside, like the typical systems notation, right? Y equals, let me see if I can put a separate note here, right? So remember that the system Y of T is gonna equal H bracket times X of T. And in this particular case, this is gonna equal H times bracket of summation infinity CK E to JK omega naught T. So how did we go and write this here by moving the H inside the summation? Well, we did the same thing that we did before with the linearity LTI system with the integral transform. What we did in the previous example is we actually, hang on, I notice now that the screen has frozen a bit. Um, okay, so uh, I hope a lot of that was caught. If not, try to review these notes and try to match it to the oral ex expression. But basically, um, what I'm saying is that we pop the H in here. So what we are gonna do is we are going to be able to put the H inside, right? This is gonna actually equal, we can move the H into the summation here. We can do that because H is linear and we discussed that that's a property of linearity where it can go inside integrals and summations. H hat. All right. So the high level here from this slide is basically that the, if your input is a complex exponential, your output is also a summation of complex exponentials, but you have a different coefficient, uh, C tilde of K, as opposed to C of K. So for LTI systems, a simple way to analyze them is as follows. You take X of T and you decompose it into its Fourier series. By the way, if this lecture we missed a little bit or if the video has stopped, we can always recover it in office hours if um, you know, there's a time lag or uh, some sort of pen input was not captured from the tablet, All right? So just let me know over email. Feel free to email me if there's a problem with the lecture. All right, so for LTI systems, a simple way to analyze them is to take the input X of T and decompose it into a Fourier series, right? Which is the sum of complex exponentials. So this decomposition, uh, is a decomposition into fundamental building blocks, which are sinusoids. Now, now that we have these complex exponentials, we know that these complex exponentials are simply eigenfunctions of an LTI system. 
So if I have an eigenfunction, I pass it in, I get the same complex exponential at the output scaled by h hat. And since LTI systems are distributive, if I'm passing in a sum of complex exponentials into my system, I get back an output, which is also the sum of complex exponentials, but each one has been scaled by some term. OK, and here, there should be a tilde, right? just to distinguish it from the system. All right, so here's a concrete example of a simple Fourier series example. We have some x of t, and we know that x of t is periodic, so it's going to be the sum of complex exponentials. Now, the problem here with this, and let's just hope the screen has not frozen again. The problem with this is when is it actually possible to find the constant ck such that this holds? Right? We want to find the constant ck so that this holds. So the rest of this lecture is going to cover this in some detail. All right, so let's start with finding the Fourier series representation of a sinusoid. So I have a sinusoid A cosine omega naught t plus theta. It's your standard basic sinusoid, right? You have, in this case, you have A being an amplitude. You have omega as frequency. And finally, you have theta as being phase. So in this particular case, I have a standard sinusoid. How do I find the Fourier series representation? Well, let's look at what the Fourier series representation is. The Fourier series representation is if I have a signal, in this case, it's f of t, but let's say it's x of t. Right, that's how we learned it. x of t is equal to the sum k minus infinity to infinity ck e to the jk omega naught t, right? So it's your sum of complex exponentials. Now, remember that Euler's formula And you'll want to really probably memorize this formula for the rest of the class, but we can write a, any cosine, cosine of omega t, as equal to 1 half times e to the minus j omega t plus 1 half e to the positive j omega t. So th this you may have seen in your high school trigonometry classes or, um, uh, or similar. So now that we have Euler's formula, what we can do is we can actually go ahead and use Euler's formula to find the Fourier series coefficients. So I know that I can break a cosine like this. So it follows just by looking at these two equations. If I do some equation substitution, if you just look at it for a little bit, you should be able to check your understanding. So we won't pause the lecture here, but you should be able to see why you to combine these two and actually get the Fourier series representation of the signal. And if you do that, what you'll see is it'll actually equal something like this. It'll equal a over two okay. e to the minus j of omega naught t plus theta. All right, plus a over 2 e to the j. Now I'm going to use red again. Omega naught t plus theta. All right, so this is what my Fourier series representation of f of t looks like. And so now we can actually make a plot 
we can plot this in a couple very unique ways. We can first make a plot of spectrum. The spectrum, whenever you hear spectrum, typically a spectrum means that you have a plot. And in that plot, the independent variable is frequency. So in this case, the independent variable would be in red as omega. Now, if I have a spectrum, the y-axis here, the spectrum only denotes the independent variable, which is the horizontal axis. So I have to specify what spectrum I'm looking at. So in this case, I'm going to look at the amplitude spectrum. So if I'm interested in the amplitude spectrum, then the y-axis here would be amplitude. So I have amplitude on the y-axis. And what I want to do then is I want to plot this black amplitude here at different values of omega. Well, if I look at this, I can just look at the Fourier series representation and make that plot. At omega naught, I have a over 2. So I'm going to have in red here, I'm going to have omega naught somewhere around here. And the amplitude of the signal at omega naught, it tells me how much of a sinusoid at omega naught. If I have a sinusoid at frequency omega naught, what is the amplitude of that sinusoid? Well, I look, there's only one sinusoid at omega naught. It's here. And the amplitude is A over 2. Oops. Black amplitude here. And the value of this is A over 2. The height of this is A over 2. That means right over here, you hit A over 2. Now, we have actually two uh, sinusoids, two complex exponentials. We have one at minus omega naught. Right? So in this particular case, here we have a sinusoid actually at minus omega naught because there's a negative in the exponent. So here I'm going to have another spike at omega naught minus omega naught. And the amplitude of the spike, once again, is simply going to be A over 2. So this is the amplitude spectrum. And we can plot other types of spectrum. Right? If I look at this, I can also plot a phase spectrum. I can ask myself, what is the phase of the sinusoid at frequency omega naught? What is the phase of the sinusoid at frequency of minus omega naught? And so if I do that, what I can get is I can get a phase spectrum. And the phase spectrum will take this form. So once again, any time we say spectrum, the independent variable is going to be in red here, which is omega. So I have omega as the independent variable. And I'm going to have one sinusoid at omega naught. I'm going to have another sinusoid at minus omega naught. What is the phase? Well, let's look at the phase. The phase of the sinusoid at minus omega naught, if I distribute this minus sign in this uh, sinusoid here, this complex exponential, then I'm actually going to get uh, a phase of minus theta. So here, the phase of the sinusoid actually goes down by some amount minus theta. Okay. And at omega naught, it actually is up because the phase is positive theta. All right. So this is a what's called a phase spectrum. What the amplitude and phase spectrum do is they give me a way to visualize. So I have a signal, some signal that went as an input, and I want to understand its structure. Remember, that was the goal of the Fourier series. And what it's telling me is that this signal is comprised of two complex exponentials that have the same amplitude but have opposite phases. So in general, the phase, there are different conventions for how you denote phase. So the phase values typically occur over a 2 pi interval. So you have phase values either from minus pi to pi or 0 to 2 pi, depending on how you have set your style convention, mathematical style convention and reference point. 
Okay, it may be worth, you know, going over a complex, uh, a concrete example. So here is a concrete example of where you would actually apply and potentially use the tools of Fourier series. In this particular example, we have a kind of a signal that's given to you. It's this kind of wave here, right? It's this wave that kind of oscillates up and down. It's got many different peaks. So I want you to, before you even read this slide, just look at this signal. I just want you to look at it. And if you look at it, it doesn't look like a clean sinusoid. If I go and show it to you and ask you, hey, tell me what are the sinusoid building blocks of the signal, um, if you're like me or any reasonable person, uh, you would say, well, I have no idea. I have no idea what sinusoids are in here. But if you gave me a signal like this, I could tell you that there's one sinusoid and I could calculate the frequency by looking at this peak to peak, so on and so forth. But if you gave me this weird thing, which kind of looks sinusoidal but doesn't, it'd be really hard for me to tell you whether this is sinusoidal or what the building blocks are. It turns out that this signal is actually very simple. So the ground truth right here is written here. This is the ground truth equation for the signal. The ground truth equation is that x of t equals three times the cosine at one hertz, all right, plus an amplitude of one cosine at, at that, you know, at, at uh, uh, in this case, one and a half hertz, and another cosine at two hertz. So it includes, it's a summation of three different cosines, and each cosine has a different phase as well to add a little bit of twist to the problem. So if I gave you this signal in the time domain, this axis is time, it is very hard to understand the form of X of T. So the form of X of T is not given to you in this concrete example. Okay, so now let's try to look at this from the viewpoint of a Fourier series. So it turns out that if I didn't give you the time domain signal, but I gave you the spectrum of the signal, if I gave you the spectrum or the frequency domain representation of the signal, then you would actually end up getting something like the following. I would have three neatly defined spikes here at two pi, three pi, and four pi. And I would also have the phases being plotted here, right? Remember that the phase of the two pi signal was zero, so I see zero there. The phase of the three pi signal Let's see what it was. The phase of the three pi signal is minus pi over four. And you can see that this is about at minus pi over four. And the other one is at pi over three, and that is represented in the plot. Okay. So in this Fugger series representation, if I just look at the positive side, for example, I can very clearly see that the signal is composed of sinusoids at three different frequencies with amplitudes in the amplitude spectrum and phases in the space spectrum. Now, if I want to see what cosines are in the signal, I really only need to look at the positive values of this particular signal, or one side of these values. Okay, so now what we can do is let's write X of T's representation in this domain. If I give you this spectrum and tell you this is the spectrum, I can also allow you to derive the ground truth equation for X without having seen it. In this particular case, we would approach the problem as follows. So this is another check your understanding question, but we won't stop the lecture for it. You can, are welcome to pause it. Check your understanding is given a visual plot of spectrum. Please write the ground truth form of X of T. Okay. All right, so feel free to pause the video and think about how you would approach this problem. Okay, welcome back. So the way you approach this problem is every spike here represents a complex exponential. So if I look at this amplitude spectrum and phase spectrum, all I need to do is add up these spikes 
together in a mathematical form. So concretely, I can take x of t and write x of t as, let's just go to this example right here. The amplitude here is 3 halves. Okay. I'll use the color red. So these are your amplitudes. So now all you need to do is you just add up the amplitudes of these signals. And this one has also a phase. This is minus pi over 3. This is pi over 3. And the blue guy, right, the blue spike at, at, at the frequency of 3 pi is having a phase of minus pi over 4 and pi over 4. And of course, the red spike, which is at frequency 2 pi, has a phase of 0. So now I can simply add up each spike. So let's add up all the reds together. So x of t is comprised of reds at 3 halves, e to the minus j, 2 pi t, plus 3 halves, e to the j, 2 pi t. Okay. Now, it's actually, the signal is also going to be comprised of the other sinusoids, right? It's made up of all the sinusoids uh, at different spectrums. I need to add up all the sinusoids because, remember, that's what we meant by the eigenfunction and the linearity. So the output is the summation of the complex exponentials at all spectral values. So I would finish this off, uh, and I encourage those of you who would like to pause the video and try to finish off the derivation of x. I would finish this off by simply saying plus one half, because that's the amplitude of the blue guy, e to the j. Frequency of the blue guy is at 3 pi. I'll first add up the negative 1, minus 3 pi. And the phase of this is plus pi over 4. And I'm going to have plus one half e to the j. Again, now this is 3 pi. And the phase of minus pi over 4. And then finally, I'm going to have plus, it's going to be 1, right? So it's going to be e to the j minus 4 pi t minus pi over 3 plus e to the j 4 pi t plus pi over 3. Okay. So you should get this answer for x. And now you can use Euler's to go ahead and simplify this into cosines if you wanted to. OK, so this is a very specific example of how you would obtain the Fourier series coefficients and also analyze the structure of a signal. One thing that we have left and we will discuss in the next lecture is how to go from the simple Fourier series example of finding the Fourier series of a cosine defining the ser Fourier series of a more complicated example, right? It's very easy now, given the tools that you have, to find the Fourier series of a cosine. So I encourage you after this lecture, but before the next lecture, as a homework assignment to check your understanding, please go ahead and test your classmates on trying to find the Fourier series of a few different types of cosines. In the next lecture, I will continue by talking about how you can find the Fourier series coefficients in general.